Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Welcome to Matter. I like the participants. Thank you. That's what I'm talking about. So we're here for Tales from the Trenches. Uh, I am Stephen Collins. I'm the CEO of Matter. Um, for those of you who have been here before, heard me introduce these, you know this is really my favorite of the events that we do because we really get to hear some of the stories underneath some of the great successes in healthcare entrepreneurship and healthcare innovation. And tonight is going to be no exception. Uh, we have a uh, guest, Mark Thierer, who's really one of the most successful healthcare ex executives in the Chicago area. You'll he hear all about his story, how he got started, how he built uh, Catamaran, sold it to uh, United Health Group, and a lot of the uh, interesting, fascinating details uh, along the way. Um, our interviewer tonight is uh, Jeff Aronin, who happens to be a co-chairman of the board of Matter, and I've known Jeff now for uh, seven years, six, seven years, uh, when we first uh, started working on this and he was uh, co-chairing Chicago Next, the Mayor's Council on Technology and Innovation, and we were really uh, thinking through how to make Chicago the best possible place that it could be for healthcare businesses. Um, so we worked together to put this place together. Um, I got to know uh, Jeff, and uh, for those of you who don't know Jeff, he's arguably uh, the most successful healthcare entrepreneur in the Midwest, and certainly one of the most successful uh, in the country, if not the world. Um, he, I'm serious, don't laugh. <laughs> I'm not just saying this because he's my board chair. Um, he uh, started in the pharma industry, kind of uh, rose up through the ranks, and then left to start a company called Ovation, uh, which he sold for, uh, it was a good, um, Returned, uh, worked at Lundbeck <laughs> for a little while, uh, and he now has about six companies uh, that he's building uh, in a range of different uh, disease areas uh, and continuing to innovate uh, and uh, get drugs approved to treat some of the most uh, challenging uh, conditions. So it's been um, interesting uh, getting to know him and work with him uh, and very excited for this interview tonight. So uh, with that, uh, Jeff, take it away. Can everybody hear me? So I'm glad to hear this is your favorite uh, event, the tale, Tales from the Trenches. I, I really enjoy these as well. Tonight is going to be especially interesting uh, because we are, we are getting to know a great entrepreneur in Mark. How many people would like to invest in a company that goes from 50 million in revenue to 20 billion? <laughs> <laughs> It's, very, it's rarely done. It's, a, it's an enormous accomplishment. Building any company is tough, though. Any company has its challenges. Even when you have growth like that, there are, there are a lot of challenges. There's a lot of moments where you know, things, could go, things could go sideways. How do you get through that? We're going to learn a lot about that from Mark. And it's not only professionally. Mark's very interesting personally. So we're, we're going to get a chance to learn all that. After I'm done doing a few questions, we have, um, uh, we're going to take some questions from the audience as well. So please send those in uh, as well. So let's start, Mark. Uh, we've known each other a very long time. Mark, uh, Mark and I sit on the board of Discover Credit Card together. And uh, we also have known each other probably for 15, 20 years mm -hmm. professionally. Mm -hmm. so, and we're friends, so it's, uh, it, it's going to be a great opportunity. Unfortunately, it means I know a lot about you, so we can uh, ask you some really hard questions. Well, we put the curbs on the road, and you know where not to go, right? Right. <laughs> so we'll, why don't we start with, um, personally, a little bit about yourself. Your background's very interesting. Um, you're, you're, you're from a small town. Why don't you tell everybody about yourself? OK. Well, it's great to be here. I think Matter is a phenomenal place. <clears throat> and I see a few very familiar faces, getting to know some of the companies here. Um, so I was born on a farm in Iowa. We still own it. And we raised soybeans, corn, seed corn, and hogs. And it really stunk there. 
Um, <clears throat> but uh, we still own that farm and somebody else takes care of it. Um, but I'm very proud of my Midwest uh, beginnings. So I'm married. My wife, Nasreen, has spent a bunch of time here at Matter. And she is an entrepreneur. She had a 20-year run at Motorola. She then spun out and built her own company named Revenue. She sold it to a private equity firm two years ago, right about when, right about when I sold, we sold uh, Catamaran to United Healthcare. <clears throat> so she's uh, very accomplished. She wanted to be here, but she's at our place down in Florida, um, so I can make stuff up. Uh, this is going to be good. And then we have two kids. Stephanie is eight, uh, 28. And she just, we just sent her back for her second year at Duke. She's in the MBA program. And she spent five or six years at, uh, at uh, United Healthcare, actually, well before they bought our company. And then our son, Jonathan, is, uh, works at Optum. He's, uh, he's in the data business. And so we get to see a lot of both kids. And, and uh, we're very blessed. I, that's, that's the ultimate scorecard, you know, when you take a look at your kids. And, uh, the rest of it's interesting, but that's the ultimate scorecard. That is. Your wife did a good job. <laughs> she so, did. Uh, <clears throat> so professionally, so, and you went to University of Minnesota. Right. Professionally, you started out with IBM, not, not a, a, a healthcare company. What, what were you doing at IBM? Well, I was, yeah, I was at the University of Minnesota, and IBM had a big location in Rochester. And, uh, you know, it set out in 1982, the normal resume drill, and had a bunch of different things. So I signed on with IBM as a buyer in manufacturing in the Rochester plant, and then within six months they asked, this is back when they moved everybody all the time, they moved me to Florida for the PC business, and I was down there as a very young first-line manager and kind of started my career with IBM. Um, and it was a lot of fun because they really trained you. Back then they trained you a lot as a manager, as a salesperson, and all the rest. So. After a couple years in uh, Florida, I got a chance to move into healthcare with IBM in uh, 1985, moved out of Boca Raton, and, and uh, that was kind of the beginning of my healthcare run. I was in the healthcare vertical here in Chicago uh, and calling on hospitals and uh, healthcare providers and manufacturers like Abbott and, and Baxter, which is ultimately how I right. got introduced to Caremark. Yeah. Right. And then you transitioned over to Caremark. What, 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 um, what did that look like? Why, you know, you, then you went directly into Well, it was interesting because I'd been 10 years with IBM, moved all over the place. They moved me down to Boca, and then they moved me to Indianapolis, and this is what they did. But um, I was going to have to go to New York, just had gotten married, and, 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 you know, that was the executive track, and it was just not going to work. So I think this is interesting for, because this will happen, there's a lot of young people here. In your career, you'll make three or four big changes. You might make five or 10, who knows. But you make these decisions, and, and, um, and this one I made thoughtfully. So I did a lot of work. I thought about healthcare. I kind of mapped out my strengths and what I wanted. I knew I wanted to be in Chicago, raise a family here. I didn't want to move all over hell. And um, so I, so I kind of mapped out some choices, and I actually proactively ended up getting connected with Caremark, reached out to the CEO, kind of talked to her people and said, you know, here's what I've heard you need, here's what I bring, and we kind of got married. And from there, it was, it was a good ride. So, uh, so that's what, that's what kind of fueled my transition. It was kind of a life change uh, to move from technology into healthcare services. But, but one of the things that you did that I tell entrepreneurs is, even if you're an entrepreneur, get training from a big corporation is, is often useful. So you had IBM and Caremark as yeah. training grounds. Absolutely, and you know, at IBM, they train you to be a manager. All this stuff is trainable. Train you to be a leader, very trainable. And I encourage you to find a way to to get yourself sharp in that area. Stealing shamelessly from people you respect is a good way. But train me as a salesman. Train me as a manager. A lot of training at IBM. And then at Caremark, it was much more industry specific stuff. Still a big company, um, but I did a lot of different jobs while I was at Caremark. I probably had five or six jobs in a ten-year run. And at the end was, uh, you know, kind of the number three operating executive in that structure. And uh, at that point, I had done sales. I'd ran the marketing operation, strategy, M&A, and then our industry relations, which was interacting with the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and I did that for several years. And so I kind of got a 360-degree view of the pharmaceutical supply chain, including the customers who brought, bought these services. 
and that was a great, that was really where I cut my teeth on the space and got, uh, got familiar with kind of all four corners of the PBM market. Right, yeah. very important. And you were doing well, you were growing, Caremark was doing, why'd you leave? What, what did that, what, what happened there? Well, uh, so it always happens you know, in your life, this, this may happen to you, uh, I got whacked. Um, the, long story short was we went through some leadership changes. Uh, a new guy came in to lead the company and he walked into my office and said, you know, we're headed in another direction and it doesn't include you. <laughs> and I called my wife, I remember this, I said, you know, I, I'm not sure, I think I just got fired. <laughs> so, uh, but it was just one of these things, you know, leaders field their own teams, I wasn't part of his, and um, at the time it was a huge bruise because, you know, like most of you, very successful, used to achieving, I really hadn't had much negative feedback up to that point, and that was like, twa-bunk, and um, it's a good time to reset, it's really a good time to reset, but I think back, back on this, and you know the guy who uh, this happened with, um, pretty mean dude, but nonetheless, um, <laughs> not, nonetheless, I thank him for it. Um, after that is when I kind of kicked into another gear professionally. Yeah, That's great. And I'm sure he would take credit for all your success. <laughs> so you, you then went to run a division of Allscripts, which was a much more entrepreneurial environment. Well, and that was, a, that was a big leap for you to go from corporate infrastructure to a much more entrepreneurial uh, type environment. What was that like? Yeah, that was, um, well, some of you may know Glenn Tallman and Lee Shapiro. They're good friends of mine. Um, and that's, that's kind of what, well, I think it's interesting. So after I got fired, I took six months. And I literally, um, another Control-Alt-Delete reset on what am I going to do? So I learned to play the guitar. I posted 75 rounds of golf. I uh, uh, spent time with friends and family. And I took six months reorienting what was important. And um, that was really useful. Time well spent. I'd encourage you to do it while you're through transitions. Uh, but joining Allscripts, I'd known Glenn just from the circles in the, in the city. And uh, he hired me as a consultant, actually. So I was just, you know, like a... And actually, he paid me in stock. So I didn't take a paycheck. He paid me in stock. And in retrospect, that was, that was good. very good. Yeah. Uh, that was very good. And, and, uh, but it was very different. Very much. Uh, and in fact, this is when I think, you know, this was about when you and I first met. But I was running one of their divisions. I wasn't running the whole company. And we're one, you know, and very much a kind of a shoot 'em up, uh, very entrepreneurial. Uh, and I really enjoyed it and, and learned a ton. I learned a ton and, and wasn't looking for something new, but you know, had an opportunity uh, with this little company that they ended up plugging into that in the end I ended up leaving all scripts. Well, let's, let's talk about that opportunity. This was a um, public company from, Can I believe in Canada. Right. Very small. SXC Healthcare Solutions. Right. So tiny little company. I remember when you did this, you know, why, you know, first of all, why did you go there? You know, going on a board, and that's a small board. Did, what did you see? What were you thinking during that process? Many people in their careers are looking at boards, and how should they be thinking about that as well? Yeah, so I was a president of a unit inside Allscripts, and my phone rang. It was kind of just serendipity. And, uh, you know, would you want to join a small publicly traded on the TSX, on the Toronto Stock Exchange, publicly traded software company. It was a software company. Um, and I, I think, first of all, I encourage you to get some board exposure along the way if you get a chance to do it. It's, it's a different dynamic than running your own business. Um, but so I joined as a board member, and Glenn and Lee genuflected, that'll be great. And um, after about two board meetings, it became clear, because SXC, just a little bit of background, SXC Health Solutions, was kind of the intel inside the pharmacy benefit management market from a software standpoint. Somewhere around 60% of the market was using that technology to run their own PBM operations. So we were all over the place, kind of intel inside the PBM world. And 
while I'd been at Caremark, we used it ourselves. So I had a familiarity with the application and all the rest. So I joined the board and it was kind of a fit because I was sort of like a, an executive level user of the technology and uh, not really. Uh, but long story short, I joined the board and after a couple board meetings, they approached me and said, hey, you know, you know this business. Um, the gentleman was the CEO, was in his mid-60s. It was just kind of a natural, why don't you join us as the president and CEO? Oh, oh. And, uh, you know, I talked to Glenn and Lee about it, and I ultimately said yes. I think one thing I'll share about that transition is I made a deal with them, and that was that I'd find my own replacement. And so I stayed about another three months beyond what I would have otherwise done to find someone to run that business for him because I wasn't going to leave him hanging. So I think that that's important because to this day, um, they are not just friends, but they're advocates, and we've invested together, and all the rest. Yeah. So it's a long road, and you want to think about you know, how you leave things. Um, but so that's how it came down. And I, and I, uh, I left in September 2006 and joined, I stayed on the board and joined as the president and COO, kind of with a glide path to the CEO role. That was, that's how it came down. So you, after you transition out, which was, you know, I, I think that is, a, that is an important message because a lot of people, you know, often aren't exactly sure how to handle that. But I a lot of people, it's kind of all about you, and you have to think about what are you doing here in terms of the wake you're going to leave. And as somebody that hires a lot of people, I will tell you, the, you, you respect the way somebody leaves the other company as well because... You know, it's that, that, uh, that character that you're bringing in as well. So you made this change, small company. What, what was your, you know, listen, you, you, did you have a vision from day one? What was, you know, it was a small company. You had to go build this. What were you thinking? What was your, your, your well, the first, yeah, process? It's a, the first thing I was thinking was, as a public company and I get to run it, which was really what I was thinking. And... Uh, because I'd kind of been trained and ultimately had, had hoped I'd get a swing at something like that, and it was small. But um, it's one of these things, I kind of knew what to do. I knew the product. I knew the market it served. So this idea of going and doing something you don't know anything about, I always counsel people, don't do that. You know, do something you know what you're doing. Right. It's better. And so, um, <laughs> and, and so I kind of had a feel for it. but. Uh, you know, what really happened when I got there, I didn't have a vision other than I wanted that job and uh, transitioned out of all scripts and I came into that thing and sort of assessed the, we had about 100 people. I mean, when we sold it, we had 5,000 people in the company. And, um, but we had a bunch of domain experts and software developers. And the thing about the company was we'd been embedded inside 60% of the rest of the market. And so... I could see that the idea of growing that footprint was going to be very hard. I mean, when you got 60% of a market, you're capped. I mean, you know, that, you're, you're like, that's, so growth was going to be hard. And um, this is the other thing I like to talk about, which is stand tall and make, you know, you're going to make three or four big strategy decisions in your life. And this one I'll take credit for. We decided, with the, in conjunction with the board, and it was my deal, to move into the full service business by acquiring one of our customers and becoming a full service PBM and competing with our entire book of business. And that was a bet the business, bet the, bet the company strategy that um, it was the spark that started the whole thing. And it was the reason we, we were able to really scale that business. That was a big bet. And uh, it's the one biggest bet that I've made that, that we got right. Right. Well, you so uh, first of all, I think it's important to point out you were strategic in some of your career choices, but you're opportunistic in others. Very you, much. This was an opportunistic opportunity or, or process where you said, you know what, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but I know there's an opportunity and I know I'm prepared in my career to do this. Well, you've done that yeah. four or five or six times with different therapies. So, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what happened. So when you, I, I, that's fantastic. You now are in a role, you see an opportunity, and you made this bet. Now doing that sounds 
brilliant at the moment. Like 20, you know, you're looking back on time, it sounds like a great, but at the time, I'm sure you had board members and employees telling you, hey, Mark, wait a minute. We're competing now with our customer. We're going to get killed. How did you manage that, you know, different environment that you were dealing with at the time? One of the guys who helped us with some of my acquisitions is in here. I don't know where John Phillips is, but I, I saw him, so he'll, he'll know this. Um, so the CEO didn't want to do it. He was a software guy. Why in the world would we do that? We're making 40% margin on the software. You know, we're going to have an exit. You know, I'd like to sell the company. And uh, so we had this bifurcation, and he seated the board. So we had this parting of the ways. And ultimately, I'd, I'd had to say, look, this, this is about the business. You cannot grow it. I'm here. I'm going to recruit talent. And uh, this other dude's going to have to go, <laughs> really, is, is how it came down. And the board, so we wow. forced a decision. And, uh, and the board said, we're headed this other way. This, 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 this other path. And so that was, that was a little bit of nail biting um, because none of us like conflict. You don't, right. you don't just look for that. But um, <clears throat> getting everybody around on that decision was a lot of work, especially the customers who were wigged out that we were now going to compete with them. And we had their crown jewels right here. I mean, every time they wanted to make a programming change to their core application, they'd come to us. Right. And then they'd be responding to RFPs in the marketplace with us in the hunt. We were in a really strong position. After you did it. Because where were they going to go? Right. And so we took full advantage of that. And while we did, we treated these customers with total tender loving care. Never gave them a reason to think we were cheating them. Always were very competitive. We just were better than them because we knew how to drive the car at a whole nother level because we developed it. So uh, that was difficult too, but over time, and I met a gentleman here from Morgan Stanley, and you, finally we got the sell side analysts starting, after the stock started to move, we got the sell side analysts understanding what we were doing, but there was every contingent needed to understand what the strategy move was about, because it had a lot of people shaking their, scratching their heads, yeah. Anything in a competitive environment, when you make a change, it's, a cha it's, it's tough. It's oh, yeah. A challenge. So you were doing, part of your strategy was acquisitions. And let me tell you, acquisitions are tough. When you do one, it's really tough. Everybody's on board. Two, you know, it's even harder because now you, you got more going on. Three, so you did eight, ten? We did a dozen. A dozen? So you did a dozen acquisitions. How many worked? How many didn't? What was the... You know, what was the ratio? Well, this is the thing What's just, you, you, you would think, oh, you did a dozen acquisitions, you had a couple whiffs. We didn't have any misses because we were buying, think about this, we were buying our customers. We knew the decision makers, we knew their people, we knew their application, we knew the claim count going through the engine. We knew them almost as well as we knew ourselves. And then we took their applications and we basically would buy these firms, put them on our frame, and there'd be low execution risk. There was no core system conversion. So the execution risk that comes along with most acquisitions was non-existent with us. And we never strayed very far off this, off this map. We stayed right on this thing. That's we were right. relentless about it. And so we didn't have any misses. And some of these were gap accretive in a quarter, which is unheard wow. of. Unheard of. Unheard of on, on public company trading and doing M&A. So you made it easy for your colleague in the audience. He just, he was. Yeah, it was easy for him. And, um, uh, but that, that, so. M&A can be a real, a, a real growth engine, and you just have to just make sure. And then, of course, we put, we put a great right. team on the thing. We kind of got a cookie cutter, sort of a meat maker, meat machine coming out here, and we just started doing it the same way. We did it 12 times. That's it great. Yeah. That, that is a great track record. So if you're able to do that, you're growing, business is growing, market value is growing, you ended up selling to the world's largest Healthcare service provider. What, why did you do that sale? What, what was your thinking behind that? Was well, it was so thing? much fun building this company. We built it into so the metrics at, at the end were we were doing twenty billion dollars, just under a billion dollars in EBITDA, and that was up from ten million dollars in EBITDA in two thousand five when I joined the board. And so it was kind of a wacko growth curve that that really. Uh, 
I don't know if I've seen anything like it out there. It was, it was kind of a 50-fold shareholder wealth accumulation drill. Um, but, but, you know, the, what was your question? <laughs> Why would you sell? Why would I sell? Oh, I didn't want to answer. You had your dream job, <laughs> your CEO, public company. Well, this is funny because we didn't want to sell. Uh, uh, and it's public news, so it's, it's, uh, you can read it in the S4 in the filings. We, I decided, we were number four in a market. It never ends well for a number four player in a market that's consolidated. You can go through any kind of industry. It's just, I could just feel we were moving up, competing for much larger deals. We were moving up the food chain, and it was going to get very hard. So I approached the number three player, which was embedded inside United Healthcare, Optum, this is behind, at the time, Express Scripts and CVS Caremark. And I approached them and I said, you know what you should do? You should release a lot of value to your shareholders, spin that unit out and put it in my public frame. And this, we called it a reverse Morris Trust, was going to release billions of dollars of shareholder wealth. And it was like, they should definitely have done it. But then they didn't. <laughs> and uh, after about a two-month dance and diligence, you know, they're not in the business of divesting as a general rule. Right. And uh, they kind of turned it over, turned it around on us, and they acquired it. So I wasn't looking to sell the company. But I did need, knew we needed to get scale to compete at this next level. And by doing it, we kind of created a oligopoly of the top three players each with roughly, call it 20 to 25 points a share, give or take. So that math was, that was good math. And, and, it, and it totally worked. And that, in the end, is why we sold. Plus... We got $13 billion for it. Yeah. That was the other reason That's that we sold, because our shareholders, our shareholders did very well. Right. And, you know, look, ultimately you are, you're, you know, a, you're working for your shareholders. Yeah. And you need to do what's best. In Absolutely. Um, so you did then, you, you went from running the company to running a division of the world's largest health care provider. Right. Um, service provider. And that was a whole different change for you. So now you're CEO of Optimum Express. Yeah, and that was a big change. And so, you know, United Healthcare is uh, north of $200 billion market cap. It's a $200 billion revenue business. Half of that is in the services business called Optum. And uh, to, on the run rate this year, about $70 billion of that is OptumRx. And so I was running the OptumRx unit as, a, as an operating unit inside Optum. And... What was that like? Well, they signed me on for two years and made it very interesting to do that. Um, so I was, I was still wanting to work. I still want to work at some level, not too hard. But um, the, 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 what was it like? It was a clinic. There's no accident that they are four times the market value of Anthem or Cigna. You put Cigna, Anthem, Aetna all together, they don't equal the market cap of United Healthcare. And it's because at the top of the food chain, that is a unparalleled leadership team that is an academy in healthcare, right. in my opinion. Um, and it was fun to run with those guys because they're very good at their work. They are very good. And, and uh, it was a whole other set of calisthenics. It was weird having been, you know, I had 5,000 people. They have 250,000 people. And uh, it was weird to come in and, you know, I wasn't running it. So that was an adjustment, but not they didn't really crowd me very much because it was another integration, the kind of which we'd done 12 of, right. which is why they asked me to stay to do it. And, uh, and then I trained the new guy, and I was expecting after, after the two-year run to move on, and, and it came down like that. But I learned a lot and uh, would just say that if you ever think about a large company opportunity, you know, go to the best in the business, whatever your space may be and um, learn from the best in the business. They are the best in the business. There's, there's no doubt about it. It's an impressive thing you made it two years. Most entrepreneurs usually don't make it. Uh, I slowed down pretty much after, you know, after the first year, and then that last six months was pretty slow. So. Great. <laughs> so what a, what a run. What, just, a, just an incredible run um, that you had building that, transitioning, remarkable. Yeah. So now you're done. You look back, think about, you know, what's your leadership journey been like? What, what, would, what would you tell the audience about leadership and your journey and maybe the mentors that got you there? Could you talk a little bit about that? 
Well, this is something that, I mean, I saw a couple of folks, David and, and a couple others who actually worked with me during this time. So they know this is not just like charts or some spiel. Um, I really do believe that, um, like the wealth that you created at Marathon and now at Paragon, it's a leadership drill. So I'm a big believer in what do leaders do, what's your shadow, how do you cast it, and then how do you run the business? So I'm an operator. I was always working hard to communicate a strategic vision and then working hard to make sure we had four or five things we were working on. I was never the plumber at the bottom of the pool, but I could go there. Everybody knew I could go there. And just this setting of direction, most of the leadership tutelage I got, I got at IBM, which at that time was kind of a leadership academy. Um, but I did latch on to about five or six people who had the courage to tell me the truth all along the way. You know, they're not going to believe your bull BS anymore. And they would tell you, here's what you could have done different, could have done better. And so I just encourage you to build your own little cabinet and get people who will tell you the truth, not what you want to hear. And um, I still have those people in my life. Uh, and I was sharing a story not too long ago about uh, some really tough feedback I got from, uh, from an old salty dude who's still part of my cabinet. And this is, what, this is what really can help you. This is really what can help you become a better leader. So um, look, I think it's, it's just working very hard. I always believed in leading from the front, be in the market, not in your corner office, be connected in your industry, and you have to be an expert. You know, people want to do business with experts. Right. And, uh, you know, it's like you in your space. I mean, you know, you, you've got to know the score. And I did. I was very close to the flame. So, I don't know, not a very elegant leadership mantra, but that's how I did it. No, listen, I think, I think it, you, it sounds like you were hands-on, you had good people, and you dove in where you needed to dive in. Yeah. And I, I, you know, it wasn't a, a style where you were in the corner office dictating. You were actually out there, and I, I think that's important. Yeah, it was, and I enjoyed it. So are you, you know, I like it that you had, you know, I, I say the same thing. It's important to have mentors in your career as you're building, people that will tell it to you straight. Um, are you giving back? Are you mentoring? Are you helping as you've uh, thought about these next steps of your career? I am. I had lunch today with a woman uh, that uh, I've known, and we sort of mapped out kind of a T-chart. I like to do this thing, and I don't know, David, if I ever did it with you, but a sort of T-chart on what you bring and what you want to develop in the future. It's this notion of an individual as a share of common stock, and how do you add value to your share so that you can be traded on the public market because this notion of adding value through experience, education, feedback, that's what you should think about every day. And so I like to talk about people in a career counseling setting on what about your share of common stock and what, are you, what value do you bring today and over time what do you want to bring. So I, I do that a couple, three times a week. And I get people, mostly from my old company, who knew I did this, hey, would you sit down and spend a little time and talk about my career? And I love doing that. that that's something I've done quite a bit since I slowed down. I, I think that's great, Mark. And I, I tell entrepreneurs all the time, people that have had some success in their career, a lot of success like you, they want to help out. They want to give back and help entrepreneurs as well. Well, this is interesting on this, because how many times do you get called either for donations, some kind of charity thing, or to help a colleague. And you say, yes, sir, I've watched this with you. You say yes all the time. I do too. Yeah, I think it's very That's important. because people do want to help. And so you shouldn't be shy to ask, because people do want to help. As a general rule, I mean, they may not say yes every time, but as a general rule, they want to help. It's one of the reasons Steve and I built Matter, is to create an environment where people like you could help and, and give back to others. It sounds like one of your styles is to create this T-chart I know some of the other things you've done uniquely about your style. One was, and you're kind of famous for this, it's the, I might get it wrong, who used to work with Mark? Where's the, okay, what is it called? There we go, the, I think it's called the Mark Fear Amazing, Amazing Sticker Cards. Can you, Mark, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this has kind of become a little bit of a trademark, uh, which I think you should have a trademark. And it could be anything. Maybe you like to go out for beers, and maybe you like to 
whatever your thing is that you want to connect with people on. But this is, uh, so I've collected, I probably have 50,000 stickers at my house. And I collect them, and I have stickers for food, pets, countries, sports. You name it, I got a sticker for it. I got a sticker for everything. And what I like to do is um, I like to send them to people. I find a cool card, as an example, you closed a big deal, or you, or you had a baby, or you successful on a huge project. And so I'll, what I write in it is what's important. But I always take the, you know, I get some pictures, and I assemble some stickers, and I do little captions. And so it kind of becomes a little bit of a scrapbook that shows up in your mailbox. And I still think people like to get letters. And so I've probably done 500 of these along the way. And they take about an hour or two to build. And I have a lot, typically pour a glass of wine and light a candle and laugh. My, wi my wife goes, who are you doing now? And so like, um, sticker card. So, I've, so been, I've been lucky enough to get one of these. I, I, I took a group of, uh, of, of, our, of our friends on a ski, on a golf trip, golf trip. Yeah. And I got one of these. Let me tell you, it looks like they, I wasn't sure I was allowed to open it. I showed my wife, I said, do we open it? It has the seal on it. But it really was uh, spectacular. Now, before people think you're a really big nerd for doing these sticker cards, <laughs> you also had a unique career in music. What, oh, can you, can you now you're off that? the curb. All right, that's all right. <laughs> da, 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 da. Well, so, so, so in high school, late high school and first year in college, I was in a band, a rock band, called The Reflections, and uh, had hair right down to here, you know, split it in the middle, did one of these. And um, the reflections, we were, we were pretty happening. And uh, we performed, no kidding, on the Jerry Lewis telethon on the big, TV. Big time. Yeah, it was big time. And we sang, I sang, and the other guys played Crocodile Rock and Roll Over Beethoven. And so th that was the extent of my you know, rock star days Look, right there. If this healthcare thing doesn't work out, yeah, I mean, I like. Expect. All right, before we go to Q&A, um, I do want to mention you are now an investor. Yeah. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what you're looking at, what you're investing in? Yeah. So my wife and I have formed a family office called Asset Blue, and uh, I've got an investment philosophy, which is I only invest in things I understand, which means markets I understand and you know, in, in a place where we can add some value. So we're looking at early stage healthcare companies. Um, that could be in the supply chain, the pharmaceutical business, the healthcare IT business, the data and analytics business. But it's all healthcare and it's focused on platform businesses. My wife's business was a platform business, software as a service marketing automation business. And so she's got some folks in our family office that she brought. And so we're looking to deploy capital uh, in, in, in those areas where we kind of know we can create value either through Introduction to customers, introduction to investors, introduction to exits ultimately, and you know, how can we shorten the cycle for value creation and take the curve up and make them some money? So that's kind of what we're looking at doing. We've made a few investments so far and and talked to a number of people in Matter, in fact, along the way. So it's been good. That's great. There you go. For, uh, Matter entrepreneurs. Uh, it sounds like um, Asset Blue, correct? Asset Blue. Asset Blue is open for business. Um, so I got a few questions that you've submitted, and I'll go through. It looks like uh, there's a lot of similar questions. Why don't we start with um, Mark? Um, a lot of people want to know, look, you're certainly an expert in the PBM area, and it's been in the news lately as, as an area um, with a lot of change. What do you think of the future of PBMs, and, and how would you look at that as an entrepreneur? Yeah, when I was talking to the gentleman from Morgan Stanley, um, I got a very weird call about five or six weeks ago, and it was from a guy named Adam Bowler who runs the innovation office in CMS. Um, he said, why don't you come and spend a little bit of time as an ex-industry executive, and you don't have a dog in the hunt. We want to just bounce a few things off you. And uh, I said, I'd be happy to. So they gave me a date certain to come, and it was like three, four weeks ago, whatever. And I went at a prescribed time. And Alex Azar, who runs Health and Human Services, Seema Verman, who runs all of CMS, the gentleman who runs all of Medicare, Adam Bowler, and a couple, three of the architects of what's going to come down in the coming weeks and months were all there, not to ask me what to do, but to pressure test on what they've decided to do. And they're going to effectively, 
uh, and this I can share because if you do a little Googling, you can get there. They're going to effectively eliminate rebates for government-sponsored programs. For Medicare and Medicaid, it will be eliminated. It may be moved to the point of service or totally eliminated so the gross price in pharmaceuticals will be net, net price, and the pharmaceutical industry will agree to price that way. Um, there are a bunch of associated uh, other tactics that the government is taking on, all with one thing in mind, deliver on Trump's promise to lower drug prices. So this is going to be another one of these. He's going to stand up and he's going to take credit for lowering drug prices in the United States. And so I think that in the short term, there's going to be uh, confusion and some chaos. I think in the long term, it's a very resilient industry. And if you're on the side of cost savings in, in, in the industry, you're in a good place. So I'm a big believer in the innovators. Nobody has anything to do unless you're bringing new drugs to market. But then I do think there needs to be a channel to keep the pharmaceutical industry and the companies honest. And I think that is the role that PBMs will play. They've morphed over the years. They're going to morph again. And this, these are going to be some big changes. I don't think the marketplace fully exp appreciates what's coming down the path. And it was, fan it was just phenomenal to be in the room with them because they feel like they have kind of unfettered air cover. And they can do, yeah. they're not worried about the blowback, the political blowback from the seniors or anybody else. They're just not worried. They can, ex they can go execute and do it. They, they're just, they just have air cover all day long. And um, great. whether you like, you know, it's separate from the politics, you know, that's new for government. That is totally a new, that is a new mindset. And so um, that was a fascinating meeting. And there are some changes that are in the short term pipe. They're going to come. That's some great insight, Mark. Very good. And you know, along those lines, you have uh, uh, several questions asking, um, you know, if you're, how would you, uh, how would you think about the healthcare industry for entrepreneurs today? I think it's the most target-rich environment you could ever hope for, and you're a great example of it with these, you know, placing multiple bets on 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 molecules. A lot of them, neurology-based therapies, you've got a great track record that way. But that's just one segment. The pharmaceutical segment is just one segment in a, in a trillion dollar, north of a trillion dollar industry. I think the opportunities in data, data analytics. I was talking to a gentleman here with software as a medical device, no longer taking pills, but taking a prescription that's actually driven through an interaction changing your behavior and creating a medical outcome. This is going to get paid for by insurers. and You don't ingest a pill. Think about that. So I think the opportunity for, because still, healthcare is a mess. And it's totally inefficient. And, you know, we could go on and on and on, but all that creates opportunity for entrepreneurs. And one thing I'd like to say is you don't have to do the whole thing. You, if you just solve a component of the problem and you can prove it, you'll get paid so I always encourage people to narrow your focus. Don't broaden your focus. Create real value, prove it on a narrow focus, and then if you want to over time. But that's the thing. I think healthcare, that's why we're only investing in healthcare. Because we know how to make money in healthcare, and there's a lot of money to be made. So I think it's a phenomenal place to be. Right. I, I agree. I think if you innovate and can create new op, whether it's new drugs or new technologies that save dollars in healthcare or make improve lives, there's a lot of opportunity. A lot of opportunity. Disruption creates good opportunity. You know, one, one of the questions that, that's uh, come along is um, at the PBM, you had a lot of patient information. You had access to a lot of information. Were there any ethical decisions you had in that process? Ooh, that's a good one. Well, so, yeah, I mean, uh, First of all, we serviced our own employees. So we had 5,000 people who were on a drug plan. And when you're setting up drug plans and then putting approved drugs together and reviewing claims, you're seeing the drugs that people are on. So how do you, with your peers, build a fence around what medications am I on? So I had a special little one over here that nobody could see for me. But no, I'm teasing. The, the, the whole thing is this whole idea of HIPAA and limiting people's vision into these patient records is a huge issue. There were a lot of ethical considera considerations around that. 
but it was mostly customer stuff, HIPAA breaches. We had a couple uh, along the way, and sharing this information is something. You gotta put this like first on your agenda and build a force field around it so that it doesn't happen. It's really serious business and you have to treat it with tremendous discretion. Right, good. And another question we have, I, by the way, I love this thing. These, these questions, this is a great audience. These questions just keep rolling in. It's hard to keep up. One of, one of the questions is, um, what's your favorite business book? My favorite business book? Oh gosh, let me just think about that. Um, I like putting Mark on the spot. Well, I mean, I, and I was just devouring him. Uh, now I'm reading pretty interesting novels. Um, but my best, my best business book, uh, let me just think about it. I don't we have one flying into, my, flying into my brain. What we, was yours? We, we could come back to this. <laughs> what about, what about uh, you ran a dental company prior? For, I did. As interim president. Yeah. We didn't talk about anything about that, but it was one of the largest dental companies in the world. Do you, you know, how'd that come about, and what was your uh, so, experience? Yeah, that was, it was a fascinating. So when I came out of my deal in, with Optum, and I, that was September of 17, I got a phone call in October of 17 from a former board member at Catamaran. He said, hey, we've got a situation, and, and uh, you know, we're in a transition. They'd had some issues, some structural issues, and they took the chairman, the CEO, and the COO out one day and plugged me in as interim CEO. And so I hung out from about October of 17 till about uh, end of January while they recruited a new CEO. And it was fascinating. The dental industry is fascinating. These guys at Supply Clinic know it 10 times better than me, Scott and Jacob, but um, it's a very fragmented, really kind of behind, it's behind the times relative to supply chain and the technologies that go in your mouth aren't behind. Everything else is. The distribution model, the pricing model, the, there's so much money in the space. So it was fascinating, I loved it. And uh, we recruited a new CEO, he got installed and when he was installed I, I unplugged and I look back on it fondly, it was fun. Fascinating, fascinating space, yeah. That's good. When, when a lot of questions are revolving around entrepreneurship and I get, you know, a lot of people, in, in, I think, in the audience either have been or are entrepreneurs. You know, one of the questions I'd like to end with is, are you, what advice would you give somebody who is now beginning their career as an entrepreneur or in their career as an entrepreneur? What have you learned? What are kind of those core pillars that you always go back to when you're building a company or thinking about the space? Well, it's always about the individual leader and the juice that he or she brings. That's my favorite word. And it's a mishmash of intellect, drive, ambition. Ambition is huge. You know, charisma, juice. You can make things happen with and through others. So that's the first thing I'm looking for as an investment, uh, you know, uh, criteria. How much juice does the leader and the leadership team has? That's the first thing. The second thing is, do you have a track record and can you get it done? Because, you know, you're a great example of this. It's one thing to, to be all those things. It's another thing to create value and really get it done. So can you finish and do you just work your rear end off? Uh, and do you, you know, do you have the full suite of capabilities to do it? Then can you field a team? Because that was the one thing we didn't talk much about, but this notion of fielding a very strong team, you know, you just can't get it done. The multiplier effect comes through others. And um, so my, 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 uh, my advice is think about the, the shadow you cast. Do you have a lot of juice in your own way? There's lots of ways to concoct it. Are you surrounded by phenomenal talent? And will you work your rear end off to get it done? I mean, this is, it's not really magic. It's, that, it's some mix of all those things. You know, I've seen in your career, Mark, you have been able to uh, recruit great people and people follow you. I think that's a, that's a very important, you know, as an entrepreneur, you need people to follow you to go build. The other thing I've noticed in healthcare for, for this group, one thing Mark talked about is, look, in healthcare as an entrepreneur, it's usually an older entrepreneur, 
because your degree, it's more complex than just building a, you know, a, a, a website or a technology. So you really need to under, it's a more complex industry um, with so many different factors. One of the things you did that really stuck with me tonight is you were a, you worked in the organization, you worked at the customer side, you worked at the PBM side, so you really understood what all the people were doing before you became an entrepreneur. That's really true. And all throughout my career, I worked at being an expert, no matter what the job was. But I either went and got trained, or I got smart with somebody next to me, or I just really worked hard at becoming an expert. Because you have to know the answers. You can't just take people to lunch, be good looking. Be, it just doesn't work. You have to be an expert. And I worked at that. Um, but then this finding the right people is, is huge. And then the last thing that I look back and I really feel good about is you have to spend the time to win hearts and minds. And you, that's one-on-one. -on -one. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. You have to learn the dreams of your best people, all of your people if you can, but certainly your best people. What are their dreams? What are their hopes? What's their world all about? And that's what sticker cards were. They're a version of reflecting on the dreams that you might have. And so one of the things I feel really good about is we had a great run, and a lot of those people bought lake homes and paid for colleges and all the rest. And I feel great about that. I look at that, and uh, it was kind of a hearts and minds drill. So remember how to win hearts and minds as you build your businesses. It's the thing that lasts really actually the rest of your life. Well, listen, let, let, what a great place to end. You've done great things in your career, and we're very lucky to have you in Chicago to have a, a, a great entrepreneur, a great leader who has done so much. And thank you for spending the time here at Matter. And uh, thank everybody for, for being a great audience.